We're going to open the um, Land Use and Natural Resources Committee meeting, the first one of the year. And um, we have a roll call. All right, directors, when you call your name, please indicate your presence. Director Bullhan. Here. Frost. Harris. Absent. Kennedy. Absent. Nisley. Absent. Kozlowski. Here. Teeter. Here. Vice Chair Baines. Present. Vice Chair Lozano. Here. Chair Viegas. Absent. We have a quorum. Uh, do you have anything to read, uh, Robert, first? Um, You're good. There's no uh, housekeeping notes, but if anyone is making a public comment, please keep your um, comments to three minutes. Excellent. Okay, public communications. Um, do we have one? I have one here. Are there any? The, the one for is for item three, so there's no public communication. Okay. This time. Oh, got it. Excellent. All right, no public comment. Uh, move on to the consent calendar. We have a first by Director Frost, second by Director Kozlowski. We need to do roll call or? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Consent calendar passes. Excellent. Director Viegas, we recognize you on Zoom. Appreciate your attendance. Okay, moving on to item number two, which is the uh, Land Use and Natural Resources Committee charge. And this is uh, Clint. Sorry. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, it's largely the same as last year. So this committee um, <clears throat> will oversee all of SACOG's efforts related to land use, natural resources, um, all of our kind of housing implementation activities. We're going to dive into one of the really big projects before you this year, the, the 2025 blueprint here in a moment. Um, for those of you new to the committee, the, the blueprint used to be in the, the transportation committee. Last year, we moved that over to the land use and natural resources committee, so it'll live here um, through the duration when we adopt the plan in 2025. Um, we'll spend most of today's meeting kind of diving into that and looking at what the year ahead holds for the blueprint. Um, another kind of big, big theme you'll see this year is um, we are administering the more than $30 million that um, SACOG gave out to Green Means Go projects. Um, uh, last year. Uh, a lot of those projects are just starting to move along right now, and so uh, we'll be having some presentations from local agencies to come out, come in, talk to us about how they're using those, those funds. Um, ideally, we can all kind of learn from what other jurisdictions are doing and, and take things um, that might be applicable across the region. Uh, we will also be talking a bit more about kind of the next phases of Green Means Go. Um, we've got some budget challenges at the state of California that threaten a bit of the, the money that we have already awarded, and so we're working on, on how we're going to respond to that. We'd like to come and talk to you more about that um, in March, um, as well as just what are we going to do long term with Green Means Go? How are we going to keep the momentum going, both from technical support and really leaning in, but also securing more funding? We really need the funding to, um, to pay for the capital investments that that keep Green Means Go going. So th those are really the big, the blueprint and Green Means Go and all of our housing. Um, that is a big theme this year for, for the blueprint as well as that is Green Means Go. It is a housing play. Um, so we'll be coming back a lot throughout the year to talk about housing strategies, both in the context of the blueprint as well as Green Means Go. Um, and then getting some examples from around the region about how we're, how we're implementing some of the housing policies that came out of the housing, the last round of housing element updates. Um, <coughs> as well as just kind of learning from each other on, on what's working and what's not working around the region. It's a bit of a, a kind of a, a chance this year to see what is working, because there's been a lot of housing legislation that's come through the, coming out of the last cycle with RENA. There was a lot of um, new housing programs coming out of local agencies. So this year we can kind of catch up, find out what's happening, see what's working, what's not working, and then kind of recalibrate and make sure that we're still um, rowing in the right direction with Green Means Go and our housing support. Um, and we'll be we'll be coming to to all of you for advice on that throughout the year. So that's the that's the charge in a nutshell. Okay, Director Frost. For a couple of questions, I'm curious as to why why we are moving MTPSCS to land use is. Yeah. Uh, I, it's just I out of curiosity. Yeah. So um, a large reason for that is. <clears throat> the transportation, the, the blueprint is an incredibly complicated document and plan. 
Um, and the transportation committee t carries a lot of SACOG business, and we wanted to move it into a committee. The land use committee tend to not just have such busy agendas, so we can really start digging into the issues with the board a bit more. Um, really wanted to put the blueprint into your hands and have more conversations and have you guide it. And that's just sometimes difficult with a transportation committee just because there's so many items we've got to get through. Um, so this will still go, and we'll do lots of full presentations for the full board. Um, but the land use committee was kind of the, the right fit for, for having the deep conversations we know on strategy. Okay. Um, and I'll also, uh, you don't have to answer this, but do you want to give a sneak preview on which projects might be in, uh, in jeopardy uh, because of the state budget? Oh, yeah, I, I can. So um, the all of them. I mean, may not know, but all if you do, I'm curious. The, so right now, um, what the, the so what is paying for Green Means Go is the REAP 2 money that came out of the state. Um, with the deficit in the governor's budget, that the proposal is that um, to cut half of that money. And so what HCD is doing right now, um, until and these are ongoing negotiations, right? This is not the final budget. What HCD is doing right now is they will go ahead and reimburse any region up to 50%. Um, we are making the case both to the state, to HCD, we have capital projects on the line. You can't pay for a half of a capital project. We also have construction schedules we need to meet. All of these funds need to be spent by 2026. So missing a bid season or missing a construction season is a really big deal. And so we're making that point with the state, but it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's half of the money that we had. So that's all of the projects. Now, we're still trying to understand what flexibility do we have? Can we fully fund some projects and then we go back to others, that is something that we'd have to come back to you all to talk about, but we're just not there yet because this is such new information. Director Frost, and just for everybody, I want to, because we're trying to walk a line here a little bit, this is just in the governor's proposed right. budget. So it is the first, the first stop of many along the way to getting a final budget, right? So on the one hand, I was just talking to um, Director Lozano about this, on one hand, we don't want to send, we have sent a letter to all the jurisdictions giving everybody a heads up who has a grant. That was we, going to be my next yes, question. Yes, we've communicated and we've gotten lots of feedback back. We don't want to send a chilling effect that actually stops movement and stops construction and stops the project. So we're trying to give due diligence and say this is what we see and we're concerned about this. Um, but we, as Clint said, we don't want to miss a construction season. If things are about to go out to bid, we don't, actually, we don't believe that we should actually halt those projects, and we'll work with your staff on those. What we do think is we should be mindful of this, absolutely, but we're going to need your help in the legislature uh, with your state delegation, um, as much as you did with Green Means Go when it first passed, um, to make sure that we don't get that 50% cut that, that, that doesn't carry all the way through. And you're going to hear a lot about that from us this year, this next six months, because the budget likely, if it's on time, will be the end of June. And will the cut be across the board to everyone, or will it be discretionary? That's unclear, right? So uh, the good news is, uh, as you remember, we, we really advocated for a regional pilot program for our six counties. We got a statewide program for everybody. So our motto is, SACOG, you're welcome. Um, the, the, we were the first out of the gate because you had Green Means Go in teed up uh you you as soon as you could you actually passed a board resolution we went out there with did competitive grants we got projects awarded and we were the first to sign a grant agreement with hcd first region in the state i'm hoping that if this cut even does go through that that is worth a lot um because we have other regions that are not nearly as far along as we are but we don't there's a lot of unknowns thank you how does our regional allocation stack up against others in terms of the actual dollar value? It's all on a pop re relative population-based formula, so we got 34, 34 million. Oh, we got, but like the Bay Area, what was what was there? I can tell you, Southern California got 270 million, so a lot. Okay. They actually have been asking, we love all of our regional partners, you know, they're all above average, but they were asking, they've been asking us about, hey, how have you all used this money? and we said we would take some of it from them if they really had a hard time <laughs> spending it. We did make that offer. I haven't, I haven't Sounds like that. we might get that chance. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Okay, any other questions by directors? Any public comment on this item? There's no public comment. No public comment. Okay. I have no questions. I appreciate the, uh, the information.
and uh, looking for a motion to approve the charge. To the chair, move to approve. <clears throat> okay, uh, we have a motion by Vice Chair Baines and a second by Director Frost. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passed. Okay, now we'll move on to our information calendar. We have item number three, the 2025 blueprint. And uh, we'll turn that over to Zach. Check, check. All right, looks like we're on. All right, good afternoon, members of the board, and thank you for the opportunity to present uh, you all with an update on the 2025 blueprint, the Metropolitan Transportation Plan and Sustainable Communities Strategy um, document. So my name is Zach Miller, and I'm the program manager for the blueprint here at SACOG. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for this presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on three principal questions. Um, as it relates to the 2025 blueprint. One, where we've been, two, what's at stake, and three, where we're going. So jumping into the agenda here, I'm gonna start with a refresher on the original 2004 blueprint, how that plan came to be, and some of the key issues that were the impetus for development of that plan. Then I'll be discussing the current requirements of the 2025 blueprint. Then I'll move on and give a more detailed description of what's at stake if we do not hit our key targets assigned to us by the state, namely the greenhouse gas emissions reduction target. Then this will be followed by some of the strategies we have at our disposal um, for closing the GHG gap and helping achieve the state assigned target. And then finally, I'll get into a look ahead for key deliverables, decision points, as well as presentations in the year to come. So going all the way back to the 2004 blueprint, so to provide some background and context for this plan, in the early 2000s, SACOG began work on the original blueprint, the 2004 blueprint, which was a transportation plan for the SACOG region. And this plan was undertaken to address a number of issues that were currently occurring in the region and were um, projected to continue to worsen over time. So the region was experiencing a number, number of worsening effects in several areas, including big increases in congestion as well as emissions. Congestion projected to uh, worsen by over 60% over the plan's duration. Um, additionally, other issues were identified and being felt across the region, included limited housing options, limiting transportation choices, as well as loss of farmland, open space, and natural resources due to outward and sprawling development. So SACOG really tried to every combo of transportation investments um, to little or no effect in kind of combating some of these issues. Um, and it became very readily apparent that all of these issues were very much intertwined. Um, the common thread here being that all of these negative impacts were being influenced not only by transportation and transportation infrastructure, but also by land use. Um, so in order to address these issues, it was determined that it would be essential to integrate these two planning processes of land use and transportation in this plan, the 2004 blueprint. Um, and thus the board decided to also look at land use in the plan in addition to transportation. And the 2004 blueprint plan asked the question, what is the best way to accommodate growth and improve quality of life in our region? So the 2004 blueprint, some of the outcomes from this plan, um, the spirit of the blueprint was to integrate land use and transportation planning to really um, cut down on vehicle emissions and congestion in order to improve the quality of life for residents within the entire region. And then the, it's important to note here that the blueprint, the original blueprint and moving forward, this is not a hard urban growth boundary. It is more so a voluntary bottom up kind of locally driven plan to invest in a balanced land use and housing portfolio for the region. So now let's jump into what is the 2025 blueprint. This may be refresher information for many of you. So one of SACOG's main jobs as designated by the federal government is to maintain a regional transportation plan. Um, and this must be updated every four years in coordination with each local government. So this plan really outlines recommendations 
for public land use policy and transportation investment strategies for the Sacramento region as a whole for the next 20 to 30 years. And this includes a sustainable community strategy or SCS as I'll be referring to it from here on out. So the SCS really needs to demonstrate how the region could achieve the state mandated greenhouse gas emissions reduction target through integrated land use and transportation planning. And the plan is, um, it's very important to note here that this 2025 plan is really gonna be shaped by the triple bottom line goals of equity economy and an environment that um, have been outlined and adopted by the board last year. Um, so this plan is really gonna aim to come together around a collective vision to advance economic prosperity, support environmental health and resiliency and promote equality through reducing transportation and housing disparities across the region. So why are we creating the 2025 blueprint? So aside from the plan being a federal and state requirement, SACOG uses this plan to help our constituents coordinate planning efforts um, in order to better plan the region's transportation system. So the coordination helps improve reg the region's quality of life by making it easier and safer to get where residents need to go. And this is especially important because the growth and mobility challenges facing this re region currently are very complex and they're made even more complex by some of uh, issues, ongoing issues such as the global pandemic, the recent record setting drought and fire seasons and effects of the statewide housing crisis, which are often more acutely felt in historically disenfranchised communities. So finding pathways to create a thriving economy healthy environment for all residents in the Sacramento and SACOG region as they relate to a regional planning effort requires a very holistic and regional approach here. So what's at stake? So um, I detailed some of those issues from, the, from 2004 and the early 2000s that were addressed in that blueprint. Many of those issues still persist, um, but what I'm gonna do is concentrate primarily on the greenhouse gas reduction target here. Um, so SACOG's target for greenhouse gas reduction is stated as a percentage decrease in per capita greenhouse gases as compared to 2005 levels. Um, so the greenhouse gas reduction target for the SACOG region was set by the California Air Resources Board at 19% per capita by 2035. So all three previous versions of this plan of the blueprint and MTPSCS they all achieve this greenhouse gas reduction target um, if those plans were implemented as they were formed. Uh, and we know it's gonna be especially challenging this go around with this, with this blueprint. So if the SCS, the Sustainable Community Strategies, would not meet the regional target, then SACOG must prepare what's called an alternative planning strategy. Um, and this really shows how how that greenhouse gas reduction target could be met, but, and the reasoning behind why we don't think it's feasible to meet those targets. So beyond the cost of preparation of that alternative planning strategy document, the main risk to SACOG and its member agencies would be the potential loss of some CEQA streamlining benefits that some cities in the region use um, for projects. Um, but then maybe the larger issue is the potential loss of competitive grant money. Um, so there's several state funding programs that require the region to have an adopted sustainable community strategy and not an alternative planning strategy um, in order to comp compete for that funding. So the funding sources at risk if the regional greenhouse gas reduction target cannot be met um, and an APS was prepared include competitive transportation funding programs created under Senate Bill 1 and other funding programs funded by California's cap and trade program. So since 2018, as you can see up here on the screen, um, this, the SACOG region has received over one half a billion dollars in transportation funding from these state competitive grant programs that explicitly require a sustainable community strategy. So over half a billion dollars in funding for important transportation projects throughout the region is potentially at stake if we cannot hit our greenhouse gas reduction target. Additionally, in order to maintain... Um, Can I clarify that? Or yeah. ask we you to clarify that? Sorry about uh -huh. that. You, mean, you mean to say that if the plan doesn't exist and it's not 
a plan that has a viable path to the greenhouse gas reduction, then the funding is at risk. Yes, okay. correct. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Well, I, I wanted to also clarify because we've never met our goals with the MTPSCS. So is this something new or did, did we have to do this in the past where we would um, have to create an, uh, an, an explanation of why we didn't and how we're going to meet those goals? Oh, in goals? terms of the alternative planning strategy? Yeah. We've never done that. I, I'm not aware of any um, MPOs or um, RTPAs within the California within California that have ever um, had to go to an alternative planning strategy. Zach, I can I can add a bit to that yeah. too. Um, <clears throat> so the 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 requirement for the plan is: Do we have a can we have a path a trajectory to get to that 19% by 2035? And to your point, we have not. So when we first adopted a, an SCS, the first one was in 2012. That trajectory to 2035 greenhouse gas was much less steep than it is today. To your point, we have not kept up with previous plans, forecasts for how much infill housing we need, the type of transportation investments we need. We haven't kept up. And so each plan, it gets harder and harder to get to that target. There's a lot of reasons for why we can't, can't keep up. There's market reasons. There's a lot of things that are happening. But that, that trajectory to 2035 is getting steeper. It's going to take a lot more effort to get to that target than it has in previous plans. Um, I think that's true around the state. Everybody is kind of falling short of what their plans would need to achieve. And it's getting harder and harder the closer we get to 2035. And the, it is, to your question about when this happened, um, I think the uh, SB1, so the SB 375 that set up the SES, that's from 2008. SB1 came in in 2017, and that's where you brought in those additional requirements where they said you must have an SES to actually uh, be eligible for these specific fund sources. Uh, do they uh, specify in SB1 or SB375 who tracks what we're doing? Is someone watching us to watching our results on our GHG or CARB? Uh, the Air Resources Board does have to um, produce a, kind of an annual monitoring of how uh, SCSs are performing. Um, and they have gone back and, and told us and told the state that statewide, the MPOs, um, the regional plans, we're not keeping up with them. They're not being implemented in the way that they need to be to hit that target. Um, so they do track it. Um, and so what they expect in each plan is, hey, we know that you didn't implement it, so we're expecting more strategy, more policy. How are you going to make up that ground this time? And that's where the challenge really comes because uh, we're, we're starting to run out of things that we can do within the 10 years. So we've got to start getting really creative. And Zach will talk about some of the strategies that we're, gonna, um, that we're looking at more closely this time. Some of them even came from board conversations we had last year that we dug into and we have some, some very promising results from. So we'll get into that a little bit more, but um, is, are are we reporting then to CARB? They Those every time they update that 150 report, they send a big request to us. So we're sending. We them, have to fill that out. Yeah, we're sending them. It's a lot of information about what our projects are coming, what projects are coming through, what um, we do. We do provide um, kind of our assessment of what VMT and driving is happening, um, uh, travel is happening in our region. They have their own data sources, and so we try to make sure we're reconciling those. But yeah, we get a big data request every year out of them for uh, for these SB150 reports. And you mentioned SB1. Is SB1 the only funding at risk, or is there other funding? I'm, I wanted to understand. So there's, there's the SB1 funding, and then on the screen, I don't know if you can see it. There's a lot of acronyms. Yeah. Um, SB-125? SB-125. And then there are other funding mechanisms um, and competitive grant programs um, that are potentially at risk. I don't know all of them offhand, but they're not explicitly required to have an SES, but it would probably make the region less competitive for those grant programs if we, were ha if we did a APS oh. instead, the alternative planning strategy. Thank you. Yeah. And Director Frost, I, I, I do, um, I mean, this is, this is exactly the kind of thank you for asking questions. We want to get you engaged in this, right? This is the year of, of, of really some of the tougher 
decisions and choices around the blueprint. Um, I don't want you to come away here today thinking like all is lost. We're not making any progress whatsoever. It is a very hard target to meet. The target year always stays at 2035. And as we advance closer to 2035, right, we have fewer, fewer years. That said, um, I don't think we have in the slides today, but we are seeing an uptick in multifamily housing. We're seeing an uptick in, in, in um, housing being built in infill areas, right? The question is, is it enough? We, we also have some countervailing forces. Transit ridership has dropped off a cliff, right? Um, so I don't want you to leave here thinking like, boy, there's just, it is just impossible. It is hard and challenging. Um, it is not impossible. And the strategy that Zach's going to talk through as he continues his presentation, there are other benefits other than just greenhouse gas emissions to pursuing a lot of the things we're talking about as strategies. They are the things that you yourselves at a local level want to pursue for all kinds of reasons. Um, school buses, electric vehicles, uh, multifamily housing. So anyway. Well, can I just ask you, because sure. it seems like it, it was fairly recent that the state was kind of backpedaling on the 2030 goals to 2045. And so now we're talking about 2035 and a steep cliff. Well, a lot of the agencies are kind of um, backing off on our, our, our plan, our, you know, uh, environmental plans and at the local level. Does that counter what we're trying to accomplish here or if you're, I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with, I, I would say the 2035 target has been the 2035 target from the Air Resources Board. The only thing we may see changing is there may be some other year, target later, years coming. There, there may be a later year, a pushback, but the 2035 year is in statute. And so that year will, that year will stick around. Okay. I, don't, I, I have not heard any conversation about whether 2035 would become uh, obsolete or no longer a target year. We had 2020 was a target year as well um, for the 2012-2016 plan. We had 2020 um, as a target year. Um, when we got to 2020, uh, depending on when in 2020 you were looking, uh, you may have hit the target or not because 2020 was a very disruptive year. So it's very hard to know if anybody hit that target. Um, but we do, ha we absolutely um, will. It's in the, it'll it's say. in the law. So we yeah, it's in the it's law. It's 2035. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Is that? All right. So kind of tacking on to what James has said, we know that land use is an extremely powerful greenhouse gas reduction tool. So I'm going to be going into that a lot more um, later on in the presentation. Um, so now, let's see if we can get this moving again. Oh, there we go. All right. So now I'm going to get into some of the efforts that were undertaken last year um, in 2023. So um, what have we heard? So over the past year, SACOG has conducted extensive outreach and engagement throughout the region um, above and beyond what is required of the 2025 um, blueprint. So we undertook these efforts in order to find out what's important to people so we can create a plan that honors and helps meet federal and state requirements, but also helps build a region that really works for everyone. So what I'm gonna be calling the phase one public outreach and engagement, this was all was undertaken last year in 2023. Um, you, this may be a refresher for many of you. Um, we conducted the built environment poll where we partnered with Valley Vision to host a public opinion poll that was demographically representative of regional residents. And the panel size was about 3,000 people um, from our six counties. Uh, we worked with C2 Research on focus groups to host eight focus groups, half in English, half in Spanish, to dig deeper into four specific topic areas, including housing, pricing, perceptions of safety, and public health. We held the Blueprint Workshop in Folsom um, that I'm sure many of you attended. Um, and so this was a half day workshop attended by 300 regional residents, including elected officials, public agency staff and representative community based organizations. Um, we've also completed a number of local board tours and, and council tours, many coordination meetings with various partner agency 
projects. And we're also close to wrapping up our regional survey that was supported by 30 pop-up workshops uh, from which we received approximately 4,000 survey responses from community members throughout the region. Um, so right now we're, com we're currently compiling and analyzing the data and a comprehensive report out on these outreach and engagement efforts. Um, the data and responses collected and what was gleaned from that effort will be presented to the Policy and Innovation Committee um, as well as the board in March. So now I'm gonna be jumping into the pathway effort, the pathways effort, um, which was conducted over the span of 2023 as well. Um, so I'll be providing a refresher on what the pathways effort was, what it entailed and what we've learned from that effort. So the future, the future pathways planning effort was really a tool to compare a wide range of different futures for this region. So the effort was undertaken as a tool to help bo the board to better understand how the land use as well as the transportation decisions we make affect our future and the ability of our region to achieve our regional goals around the triple bottom line. So in terms of the three different pathways, so the pathway efforts consisted of developing and analyzing three specific and divergent futures, future land use scenarios for the region. So pathway one is largely expanding outward with the majority of growth happening outside of existing communities. And this would have the least amount of infill and redevelopment, um, as well as the least amount of small lot and attached housing. Pathway three is on the opposite end of the spectrum. And that is where we're focusing on revitalizing our existing communities um, through a vast majority of future growth uh, occurring in infill areas. So this would mostly be new small lot as well as attached housing product types. And then pathway two falls somewhere in the middle of pathway one and pathway three. And this reflects the land use pattern from our last version of this plan that was completed in 2020 and includes some outward expansion as well as robust infill. Um, so it's also important to note here that our land use assumptions start with our regional growth projections, which the board adopted in February of last year. So the projection said that our region would go, grow by 263,000 jobs and 278,000 homes by 2050, which is about 30% higher than today. Um, so when we go through a process, we would then go through the process of assigning where the growth will go all the way down to the parcel level. So I'll be getting into a bit more detail here. So it's important to note that the foundation of the assumptions in forming these three pathways are your local plans, general plans, and entitlements. Um, so every four years, we at SACOG catalog what we call a build-out inventory to understand what is allowed in your general plans, specific plans, your zoning, and all, and all of that forms the basis of our regional land use scenarios and these pathways. So this go around, it was determined that when you add up all of the plan growth across the region from all these plans, the general plans, specific plans, et cetera, it results in orders of magnitude more planned growth than we're expecting to happen by 2050 in our regional growth projections. So we inherently have to make choices as to which growth to include where in these pathways, as well as in um, future scenarios that we hone in on. So additionally, as you can see in this map, there, there's ample infill capacity to accommodate all of the projected growth in the region in infill areas alone. Um, I'd like to note here that you can see the term remaining market feasible infill capacity. So that market feasible term um, was based on obviously the, the zoning as well as the general plans and that envelope, but also uh, accrued um, economic analysis. Um, and so this is really showing where there are infill opportunities exist without taking into account really sp site specific uh, friction or constraints in terms of, um, you know, potential infrastructure that would be needed to develop these areas. How is that a valuable, valuable graphic then if that's the case? If it doesn't take into account what's actually feasible, why would you just color in every place that's potentially infill as potential infill? So it didn't get down to site specific, but there was a crude economic analysis that was conducted that kind of looked at that. Okay. But it's really to show um, from a high level that, you know, 
there's we have so much growth 278,000 homes that we're projecting and in our you know centers and quarters and established communities which are some uh you know fairly built out at this point there's still a lot of room for development there All right, so this slide here really provides you with a breakdown of the mix of housing types and what they would look like under each of the pathways. So when thinking about these pathways, what these pathways would mean for the region in terms of housing types, it's important to note a few things here. So single family residential development would remain the dominant form of housing type throughout the region for all three of these pathways into 2050. Um, we are, and you get that basically the light blue plus the green plus the orange right above that. So that's essentially all single family homes. Um, so we're a majority single family home region now, and we will be in 2050, um, but we still need to produce more attached housing at different price points. And a more balanced mix of housing in the region is important to help address the housing crisis that we find ourselves in today and housing affordability crisis. So now I'm going to jump into, yeah. Zach, real Turkey quick, Arizona. can you explain the um, the darkened areas of yes. all? Yes. So that's essentially for each of the pathways. That is the new amount of those each of those um, unit types. Okay. Thank you. So now I'm going to jump into what we've learned from these pathways, these three pathways in this exercise. So. Greenhouse gas emissions, as I've already noted, is a key performance indicator for us because it's one of the only ways our plan is actually regulated by the state. Um, so essentially we need to d demonstrate, as I noted before to the Air Resources Board, how our plan achieves this 19% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from passenger vehicles below the 2005 levels. And if we can't, the region could potentially get cut off from hundreds of millions of dollars in competitive transportation funding. So the stakes are really high here. Uh, the primary mechanism by which our plan reduces greenhouse gases from transportation is through reducing vehicle miles traveled or VMT. So this is VMT is it's essentially just a metric for how much and how far people are driving. So we know where growth occurs has a big impact on vehicle miles traveled because unsurprisingly VMT is lower in places with lots of existing jobs, services, and destinations. And then VMT tends to be higher the further you get out from these destinations. Um, so this map just provides a visual display of this and I'll get into more detail of the VMT in the following slides. Can I, Zach, can I just make a point on the VMT map? I know some of you have seen this before. Um, you might think, if you look at a map of the region or think about the region, that the urban core of Sacramento and Midtown Sacramento might be the lowest and it would just go out from there. And what's important about this map is that's not the case and exclusively, right? Um, so there's a lot of our suburban areas or older suburban areas in Sacramento County, let's say, that are, that are green, that are lower than average. You also have a lot of, you know, Woodland, uh, Davis, Placerville, um, Auburn. And then if you look, and I've talked to Supervisor Vance quite a bit about this, right? Yuba City and Marysville. And it's not to say that's very green. It's not to say that everybody up in Yuba City and Marysville is walking and taking the bus everywhere, right? You're, you're not, you, you have some of that, but you're not as much. You're taking shorter trips. And so the strategy in our region is one around really kind of smarter suburban development. It's where you don't have to drive as much or as far, but you're still gonna drive. And I think Yuba City Marysville really shows that in a really interesting way. And we talked earlier about the green means go strategy and where might we be able to get some infill development. The green and the yellow there is our green means go footprint basically, right? So we can grow more there. And we know this also from cell phone data um, and some big data that, that people really are traveling fewer miles in these places. Uh, and what you see to our, with our plan from current year out to 2040 or 2050 is you see more green and yellow. If we can be successful in our plan, we get more, more places that are green and yellow. Yeah. And they'll come back, we'll come back and Zach will talk now about kind of some of the developing communities and greenfield communities. Because one of the things that 
many of you have asked us about is, well, do the new growth areas all look red? Are they all the same high VMT or not? And so go right ahead. Right. Thank you, James. <laughs> all right, so I'll start with VMT per capita by community type here. So within the blueprint, we categorize, you know, um, these different areas by community type. You can see those on the bottom there. Um, I'll start with centers and corridors. So these are typically the most compact built environments. Um, and they have the most diversity in terms of land use, such as homes, jobs, schools, parks, um, in, a, in a pretty close proximity, as James was mentioning just a minute ago, um, as well as more diversity in terms of transportation options available to its residents, um, in terms of transit, you know, bikeable, walkable areas and connections and infrastructure. Um, I will note driving is still the major mode of transportation um, in the centers and corridors, but it's just exactly as James was saying, just shorter trips and slightly fewer people driving than in some of the other um, community types. Then we have the established communities in the gray bar you see on the screen there. Um, so that's the next most complete community um, and they're, they're a bit less compact, but still contain many of those land uses and amenities um, close to one another. So driving distances are lower than the next three community types typically that I'll talk about. Yes, Director Cutlow. May I, the, the percentage scale, is that a percentage of the average or is that a percentage of our goal? I needed to hit it one more time. Ah, the regional average. Thank you very much. Yeah, apologies for that. So moving on to developing communities. So these communities are not fully built out typically. Um, people tend to be driving in uh, neighborhoods far from daily destinations, thus need to drive longer distances and don't really have as many travel options to access their daily needs. Um, and then finally, rural residential and ag um, and the natural lands by design, these are very low density and spread out, you know, driving and driving relatively long distances is um, for daily needs is typically required here. It should be noted for those um, communities though that very few people live in these areas um, uh, relative to the rest of the region. So if these communities growth rates remain low, they will not have a huge impact on the VMT numbers for the region as a whole. Um, so this slide is really just showing that we see the best VMT performance in our centers and corridors and the VMT gets higher as you go to the established communities and then the developing and then at the further out you get the less VMT efficient it is. If you click one more time, will it show me what the percentage of each of those buckets is relative to the whole? Say that again? What is the percentage of centers and corridor residents versus ag and natural lands? You said that's a small percentage oh, I of don't, the overall. I don't have the, the okay. Be a useful we can get touch that. point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the amount of growth that goes into each community type is really important for the purposes of this plan. So we know that this plan update is gonna be even more challenging to hit our greenhouse gas reduction target than even the last plan. So ideally, we'll need to have slightly more growth in location efficient and low VMT areas and a little less in areas with higher than average VMT than in our last plan. All right. Now I'll get into the developing communities. So just as not all existing communities are the same, not all developing communities are the same. And particularly, this is particularly true of VMT. Um, so developing communities are not a monolith. There's actually quite a bit of variation as you can see on the screen in VMT performance, performance of each of our region's developing communities depending on a number of factors, including the types of densities proposed in each plan's land use diagram, um, the extent to which they're planned as complete communities with jobs and services, and their proximity to jobs and services around them. Um, so this slide is showing the variation in pathway one with some plans coming in right around the regional average and others as high as 180% of the regional average. Um, so there's lots of caveats to this, to this graphic. Um, so this is showing the outputs from our travel model for pathway one in 2050. So it's highly predicated on the SACOG assumed amount of and type of growth within each plan area in each of these developing communities and as well as the plans around it. 
Um, so for example, if only a, you know, a select few units are included in one of these developing communities in our, in the 2050 year, it will not have as efficient of a VMT as if the entire community was included in the plan because the entire, if the entire community was included in the plan, it would be a bit more VMT efficient because um, theoretically there would be more um, amenities and um, destinations closer to those units that are built. Um, so the larger point in the VMT performance of each of the developing communities varies quite a bit. Um, and it will factor heavily into the amount of growth that will be included in the 2025 blueprint. So remember, we only have so much growth um, that we're projecting into 2050. Um, so again, developing community growth that is literally under construction now, that's going to be in the blue blueprint regardless. Um, but we have way more capacity in these areas and, than will actually occur. Um, and so for the places where there is more uncertainty, VMT performance is a key consideration as we um, narrow in in a single set of growth assumptions for the plan in order to try to hit our greenhouse gas target. And some overarching takeaways from this pathways effort and what we learned from it. So this graphic really shows the VMT performance of the three pathways relative to one another. So as you can see um, through the analysis that was done by SACOG staff, um, on each of the pathways, there's a large swings in the daily VMT per capita from pathway to pathway. So pathway one is, you know, the less um, dense land use pattern as opposed to pathway three, which is the much more infill focused and dense infill pattern. And so you can see that big delta of the 4.5%. Um, and so the pathway three is 4.5% more efficient essentially than pathway one. Zach, could you go back to the previous slide? I just have a, a quick question. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, are the, the, the projects and is, uh, development that's oh. identified in each of these on the slide, are those all the projects that are listed in our handout or is that just a sample? Because the question I, the reason I ask is <clears throat> selfishly, of course, I'm looking at Galt and we have the Eastview project in there, which I understand and can see it matches the, the graph that we were given. Um, but I don't see the uh, Galt sphere of influence. However, Winter's sphere of influence is in there and Davis's is, is. is So my, why wouldn't Galt be in there, I guess, is what I'm asking. I, I think that the, the list, the map, oh, oh. is it, yeah? Uh, we'll have Bob, if, uh, Bob Tatum's our land use planner. He can come up and probably oh, address okay, that perfect. much, Thank much you. easier. Yeah, there, there's the intention for this graphic was to show as many of them as possible. There's okay. a massive list on the thing, so I, we tried to show all of them. Um, if it's not in there, it, it will be in the larger uh, table here, which you can see. Okay, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, but but there was no uh, uh, sort of picking and choosing. It was intended. No, to I totally fun. understand. And yeah. I can make the translation between the the document and this. That's that's not an issue. I just sure. wanted to know if there was a reason why it looked. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right, then moving along to the greenhouse gas takeaways. So this graphic shows the greenhouse gas performance of the three pathways also relative to one another. Um, so as you can see on the graphic, there's a huge swing in greenhouse gas emissions from pathway one to pathway three, which is primarily driven by the assumed uh, pattern of land use development in those two different pathways. So these takeaways from the pathway efforts as it relates to VMT and greenhouse gas emissions really hammered home the point that land use is one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal um, for greenhouse gas reduction strategies. Uh, so we have another is, yeah. is the, if you could back up, the percentage on this and the previous slide, is that a percentage of the targeted reduction or no, the overall, the overall? So they're relative to one another. So it's a percent change from pathway one to pathway three, essentially. In, right, yeah. in tons yeah. of, of CO2 yes. equivalents, essentially. So okay. it's not like, if, a, if, it's, if, not, if, it's not 3% of the 19% target. Yeah. It is 3% um, overall so you would, GHG emissions. Overall GHG okay. emissions. Okay, so if we currently have 100 million tons, we're trying to reduce that by 19 million tons. It's 3% of the 100 million tons? 
So, so this, yes, or it's oh no, sorry, three no, percent no, of no, the no, nineteen million the, tons. You got it's the total amount of greenhouse gas from each pathway. How much more? How many more tons or fewer tons does each pathway compare to the other pathway? Yeah. There's no, there's no uh, comparison to the greenhouse gas yeah. target in this graph. Is that, okay. Right. So pathway one uh, or pathway two has two. 0.15% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than pathway one. Pathway three has 3% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than pathway one. Okay, They're just comparing against each other. Yeah. Okay, so assuming that we have the 19% target, yeah. do any of the three pathways meet no. the 19% target? No. So, yeah, interesting question. No, they don't. But, <laughs> but here's why. Here's why. The only important this, question. Yes, it is. <laughs> it is. The path is important. Yeah, the pathways are testing land use and transportation only. We were looking to see how potent that mix is. So there's transportation network and the land use change. We won't achieve the target through land use change and transportation investment alone. So it's layered on top of that and is a huge part of hitting our target is how, how, hella work. How huge electric is my vehicles. questions, yeah. Are we going there next? Yeah, he'll get there. Okay. It's a good yeah. segue. Yeah. I'll be yeah. patient. I know we don't want to, we're not trying to bury the lead, but yes, because we're still actually working with our state partners on these numbers. But these relatively, this is what it looks like. That's the power of it. And none of them reach the target. Pathway three gets closer. And so now we're going to talk about how to close Thank the gap. You. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I'm going to give him this presentation in the opposite direction. I think, yeah, you're two or three <laughs> slides ahead of us. <laughs> All right, so how are we gonna close this gap? So we've been talking primarily about vehicle miles traveled as a proxy for greenhouse gas emissions and then a bit on greenhouse gas emissions in the last slide. Um, and we only have, to your point, Director Kozlowski, we only have GHG results for the pathways relative to one another at this point. Um, so as shown on the last slide, so we do not have GHG emissions results for one single scenario. Um, that's what we're working on right now, what we're calling the discussion scenario. Mm -hmm. um, and so, however, we do need to start thinking about greenhouse gas reduction strategies that we do have at our disposal because we do think we're going to fall short um, no matter which of those pathways or where on that spectrum of pathways um, our land use assumptions for our plan actually falls. So... There are a variety of greenhouse gas reduction strategies available to us as we try to close the gap and achieve our greenhouse gas reduction target. So I already talked about the connection between the land use pattern and the vehicle miles traveled. Um, and that bears out when we start looking at strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So reducing the distances people must travel to work, to groceries, to school, et cetera, all those trips is a very powerful tool. Um, but to achieve our GHG target and keep money coming to the region, it's going to take a package of these strategies. So the graphic here illustrates the relative magnitude of potential GHG reduction from a variety of strategies SACOG is exploring for the 2025 blueprint to try to hit that target. So last summer, the board suggested we examine the role school buses play in uh, reducing vehicle trips and greenhouse gas emissions. So in examining that further, uh, the strategy does have a lot of promise from the greenhouse gas reduction standpoint. Um, a, a really important point here is that the benefits of this strategy go beyond the near-term GHG target as well. So you can reduce congestion, it can improve safety um, around these schools. And so it kind of hits a lot of those triple bottom line framework goals that we have that the board has adopted. Um, and I use this example to say that strategies that rise to the top really are the ones that help us achieve a number of different objectives, specifically around that triple bottom line. Um, another example of the type of multi-objective strategy here is system pricing. You can see mileage-based user fee as well as managed lanes. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly. So transitioning away from fuel-based taxes to pay for transportation repairs, transportation infrastructure, uh, was a strategy that was introduced in the last plan update as a way to kind of modernize the way we pay for our transportation system as electric vehicles become a bit larger share of the overall fleet um, and thus, you know, less gas tax because not as many cars are using gas. Um, 
but pricing can also serve as a management tool um, as well, where people, you know, pay more to use the system when demand is highest. And I know you've all heard a lot about this in, you know, uh, recent meetings. So um, I'm not going to go into each of these strategies in detail, but the takeaway here is it's going to really take a coordinated effort. Um, and with many of these strategies working together to hit this greenhouse gas reduction target, and no one strategy can get us there. There's no real silver bullet, um, if you will. So the best strategies will help move the needle on both the greenhouse gas emissions target, but also on the triple bottom line. So um, I'll, I'll open it up to questions here. Yeah, if there's any questions you have on any of these strategies here, I'd be more than welcome. I may, the, uh, what is meant to be conveyed by the TDM plus car sharing being pushed over to the right and the land use and transportation strategies pushed over all the way to the right? So the land use and transportation strategies, that's showing essentially that it has a much larger scale of GHG reduction potential. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the land use as well as, you know, the transportation network married up to that land use pattern okay. um, that would be in the plan is going to give the biggest swing of the reduction okay the, the reason it's to the right is the the minimum range for the land use and transportation we're talking seven to nine percent on the tdm and car sharing you're talking one to three percent that's why yeah. they're shifting you're just yeah. not seeing tick marks or an actual x-axis but the bottom the scale of ghg reduction it's the range from kind of the bottom end to the high end that we could potentially get so, some credit for so then land use and transportation strategies may be as much as nine percent of our transportation so, um, so then why is the bar only three ish percent of the scale the the <clears throat> there's an interesting interaction on the the land use side so um a lot of it i think this is taking into account shorter trips but there's also a mode shift component when you um combine this this is just i think the shorter kind of the shorter trips because destinations are closer Okay. Uh, but land use change is also going to drive increase in transit ridership, but that would be captured in the um, in the transit the transit side of the equation. Okay. If we're going to use this graphic again, I think it would be useful to have a percentage by each of these of rough order magnitude rather than yeah. the spreader bar at the bottom. That's a little confusing. We were trying to be visual, but I we take your point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it looked like it started out as maybe a stair step where they were all additive and it came out to about mm -hmm. nine percent. Uh, and some of them got shifted over. Yeah. That's why I was asking. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else have any other questions on any of these specific strategies? Yeah, we have um, Chair Viegas uh, has his hand up on one. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering what 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 sort of assumptions are 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 being considered as part of the telework uh, strategy given the nature of what's been happening just in the last few years. Yeah, so this would be essentially local policies that would be enacted. So this is more along the lines of the transportation demand management. So it could essentially be, you know, employers offering telework options um, and stuff of the sort. So it's more on a local level as opposed to we are incorporating all the telework and the shift into telework that we've seen since the pandemic. Um, that is all going to be baked into the modeling um, that has already occurred. It is somewhat stabilized at this point, And so we are going to account for that. So this is on top of that already happening telework. Does okay. So it's, oh, God, yeah, it does. So there's, so there's not, there's no projection for increasing the amount of telework. It's sort of, it's flatlined at the moment. Is that what you're saying? You've already, you baked it in, as you said. Yeah, but then we would offer, you know, we could potentially put forth policies or um, different strategies within the plan that we could kind of um, add to the existing telework. Does that Got make it. sense? It does. I just I, I just want to internalize it a little bit in, in large part because we are seeing and we are actually in the county. We are we are kind of rethinking it. Right. There's been a, there was a huge shift for a good reason. And we are actually starting to rethink it. And, and folks and the likelihood is we will. Folks will have to start coming back into the office, not wholesale, but we're certainly thinking about it at the moment. So I just wanted to understand how what what the thinking was behind that that graphic there. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And yeah, I think this is something that we're going to have to continually monitor too for future iterations of the plan to see where you know we think it's stabilized at some you know at some level right now um, for the foreseeable future. But you know there could be you know 
big changes in return to work policies, um, et cetera, that could potentially move that needle in the future. And we're going to have to account for that moving forward. But for the purposes of this plan, um, we've kind of settled on um, a certain what is existing today. And we're using a variety of different data sources to get that information. Any other questions on this slide? All right, so where do we go from here? So we're using what we learned in the pathways exercise and that effort um, and working towards a single set of land use assumptions for this plan. Um, and, and we're gonna be calling that the discussion scenario. So moving forward to the schedule for this year. So in March, um, we're gonna bring the comprehensive phase one outreach and engagement info item to policy and innovation committee, as well as the board. Um, and then housing demand um, and trends will be brought to this committee in March as well. In April, we'll be bringing the discussion scenario info item to the board, um, and that will include the land use assumptions included in that discussion scenario. Also kind of uh, included in that will be the transportation network that will be um, supporting that land use pattern, development pattern. Um, then in June, we'll bring the draft preferred scenario. And the draft preferred scenario is essentially the next iteration of the discussion scenario after we have a lot of the conversations um, around the land use, um, some of those land use assumptions with different jurisdictions. Um, and the action item there will be to try to be to lock in the land use assumptions um, for the plan. And the reasoning behind that is we want to lock, lock in the land use assumptions. So then the rest of the year, as we work towards the preferred scenario, we can really focus our efforts on all the transportation projects that will be included in the plan. Um, and those are going to be very dependent on what land uses are in the plan. Um, and then next, we'll have a housing and health indicators presentation to this to this committee in August. Then September, preferred scenario presentation. That will be an info item. That's essentially the um, draft preferred scenario will be presented, the transportation list, as well as the land use assumptions. Um, and then in October, we're looking to uh, for the board to take action to adopt that preferred scenario so we can move on and really get um, get a lot of the plan done. So so is this a blended list where each of these things is coming to this committee and then you're also seeking action from the full board on the action items? Correct. Okay. Yeah, some of these, so the comprehensive phase one outreach and engagement, I don't believe is coming to this committee. That's gonna be policy and innovation, but yes, all the other ones will be coming to this committee. Okay, thank you. Board as well? Yes, correct. Okay. And I, I have a question real quick. Um, just. I guess just for everybody, I, uh, as we have been talking about these pathways over the last, I don't know, year, year and a half, um, I think you said it in the beginning is that one pathway isn't necessarily the pathway. And it's hard for me as I'm going through this, even today, that I get locked into one, two, or three. Yeah. So through this process and this schedule, we could come up with pathway two and a half, let's say or a blend of, right? A blend of a couple of different pathways with an emphasis on one pathway. Is that is that still accurate? Yes, that, that's accurate. So think of it as kind of a spectrum. We're gonna end up somewhere on this spectrum. It's not gonna be one, two, or three. It's not gonna be one of those three pathways. These were more used just as um, kind of testing mechanisms to test you know, some of the performance indicators and how they perform, you know, on right. opposite ends of the spectrum with one and three, and then kind of in the middle to see where we kind of need to end up um, in terms of some of our land use assumptions, as well as transportation network. Um, so yes, you, you're correct in that and then, interpretation. And then one other question is we talk about the, so in June and in September, we're going to have draft, um, I'm sorry, uh, we're at two points we're going to have draft scenarios one for um the housing demand and 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 transportation and then i'm sorry housing and health and then the other one's going to be the transportation piece right those are those are separate presentations right um so the the action items the draft preferred scenario in june 
Um, so you can think of the April, June, September, October. Those are the four main presentations in terms of the blueprint here. The housing and health indicators, as well as the housing demand and trends, those are um, going to be delivered more than likely by consulting firms that we've been contracting with um, that are you know, analyzing those specific items. And those will inform the blueprint. Um, but those four, the April, June, September, October, those are the four main um, kind of presentations and items. Okay, so, so we are going to be uh, voting on a, pref a draft preferred um, scenario in June. The and land use assumptions right. for that, not and, the transportation network. And then separately, um, the balance, right? Housing and health indicators and the, you know, the transportation plan. Is that right? There's no action associated with that, the okay. August presentation. So June is land use, October is transportation. Correct. Got yes. It. And will those two marry each other and become... Yes. Yes. That, yep. That's actually that is... why we want you to do land use first. Then we match that with transportation investments. So will there be another presentation or action after that to combine the two? Or the, is it like two steps or, or is it going to be? It's two, okay. two steps, yeah. Okay. So the first step, the land use control totals in June. Um, and then in October, it's essentially adopting the entire preferred scenario, which is land use along with transportation. But the focus will be transportation because the board would have already adopted that land use. Okay, and I apologize for my colleagues, to my colleagues for the trying to get the clarification. So no, that's any other questions, Sue? Yeah, uh, so that's the final, October is the deadline, the drop dead deadline to get it done by 2025. That is just for the, for the, for for the preferred scenario. And then after that, we're gonna be working towards getting the whole plan document done. So we need to do environmental analysis on the plan document and actually compile the physical plan document as well. So that's gonna be happening through 2025. And then we plan to adopt at the end of 2025. Got it, okay, thank you. So we're getting the game plan now and the, the actual implementation will be in 25. Yeah, I want to. I want to talk about that. Actually, what comes next after October? But okay, you know. we have uh, Chair, Chair Viegas has a question. Yes, I just was wondering, just in light of the questions, and I, I know many of us wear multiple hats and we have a lot going on. I wonder, in light of the fact that we, there's a lot going to come at this committee in the next twelve months, or certainly what between now and October, if we shouldn't have a more clearly laid out 2024 schedule. Um, in light of what's, you know, where, where the drop dead uh, deadlines for the, uh, the, the, um, the land use assumptions and then the transportation assumptions and how they're married by October um, and share that with everybody, right? So that there's no, nobody feels as though they're being either squeezed or surprised by some of the deadlines because these dates are going to come up, they're, they're going to come tomorrow for many of us. So uh, maybe just a little clarity around exactly what is going to come to us with the, the, the dates might be helpful um, so that we all kind of keep, keep it in the forefront suggestion. And, and Definitely. I think, I think maybe last year, maybe just re, re, resurrecting a document, because I think last year, didn't we get a full timeline? Okay, that might be helpful to bring that back. Yeah, how about this? Again, this is going to go to the full board in two weeks. So you're the committee. This is exactly what you should be doing is, is asking questions, interrogating. So we will work on a clearer timeline of like the real actions when, th when things have to happen and, and for the board for February 15th. Excellent. Any other questions? All right. Yeah. I have some prompts up here, but if you don't have any other questions. Excellent. We do have, oh, oh go ahead. Director Cosmos. Okay, uh, we do have one public comment on this. Chris Noren. Welcome, Chris. You have as much time as you want because you're the only speaker. All right. Well, wow. <laughs> let's get comfortable. Uh, no, I wasn't pr planning going beyond three minutes or whatever, uh, but uh, uh, great to see so many of you uh, in this context who I've worked with uh, over the years at different local jurisdictions. I'm with the Building Industry Association, so we represent all the new home uh, construction 
industry uh, throughout the region um, from small to large builders. And I just wanted to, uh, we'll just first thank uh, SACOG staff and for all their work and James for all the interaction with us on this. And um, mainly I wanted just to come forward and just kind of make a couple of um, observations and comments just to kind of help fill in some additional information as you guys look at this. Um, you know, the BIA was happy to support Green Means Go and uh, we support infill projects and support, uh, have a number of builders to do that um, and have well, worked uh, successfully around the region to do things to make those things more feasible. So I want you guys to just understand that context that we don't just do multi, or do just do greenfield. We do a variety of housing types. Um, but on the issue of uh, the, the vehicle miles traveled analysis, um, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that when you're looking at that, um, and then this is meant not in any way to, to say that the analysis that was done and presented to you was um, you know, inaccurate or anything. But one thing to keep in mind is that when projects, specific housing projects come forward, they have under existing state law have to mitigate for reducing green uh, vehicle miles traveled already. And uh, that's part of existing state law. We're paying additional mitigations um, as of a couple of years ago to meet those demands. Um, it's in law. So um, that's just, a, as you look at those kinds of questions, just keep that in mind. Um, also that, you know, that really, I mean, the car travel is, is an important factor in the overall debate about, green, about greenhouse gases. Um, but one of the other things that we, we keep, uh, one of the reasons why houses are so expensive these days, everyone tries to fight back against is that all the, the requirements for the insulation, solar, all the other things that are going on that are mainly a product of state code, of what we're doing um, generate some of those costs. And we have, you know, I, I think it's pretty safe to say that in California here, we probably have some of the most uh, energy efficient and, uh, you know, environmentally sensitive housing in the world, um, you know, on, when you look at on site construction. So um, I think those are factors that you might want to just, just, when you're looking at this, it's not just a matter of how many cars are driving to them. There's a lot of factors going into how we're addressing greenhouse gases. Um, and I just wanted to just address some of the numbers you guys saw that there's a big you know, discussion about how much housing is being built. And you know, we have, you know, we're building about 6,000 housing units a year. You know, the, the historical average and the numbers that we're looking at, are, we're trying to get to is like 11,000. Um, we're constrained by labor, not having enough of it, um, inflationary costs, um, you know, finance, a variety of other things that are causing us to not be able to build. Um, and so, you know, we have, we do have, lots of projects entitled that haven't gotten as far as they would like to, but it has many more to do with those kinds of things and not necessarily the type of housing it is. So I think some of the analysis that you're hearing or thinking about is we're not building as much greenfield as, as you know, we can get to, so we should look at building infill. Um, we support both types, but I don't, I'm not sure that those two are as interrelated and tied together as, as sometimes is discussed. I think that there's, you know, we need to look at doing a lot of things to build the infill we need. Um, and so I mean, we are supportive of doing all those things, but I think that we should just be really, really clear when you're looking at the constraints on building the greenfield that there's a lot of other things. It's not just the type of housing that it is. Um, I also just wanted to talk about, um, oh yeah, we did talk about the feasibility of these infill. You know, this is just a thorny topic and we wish that there wasn't so many constraints on building the infill that everyone talks about. Um, you know, the speaker before, I think, you know, a lot of them did a, a good job of saying that you know, we're not looking at site specific constraints. And so when you look at how many sites you could build, but then you start digging into it, I guess literally, you'll find in the soil, hey, there's, you know, these are old commercial corridors. Guess what? They ran diesel engines through here for a hundred years. There's soil is contaminated. Uh, there's infrastructure that's old. There's, you know, all sorts of access problems. And so, well, I always like to say that our builders would build stuff. If they can make a profit doing it, they'll build it there. You know? And so it's not because they don't want to. It's because that there are some very real world serious obstacles to get around to building in some of those sites. And it's not to say that we shouldn't try. We need to. We need to do Green Means Go. We need to have toxic remediation. But it's not a very simple answer of just, let's just go build here and not there. It's, it's, it's very complicated. But anyway, so I just want to give you guys a sense that you know, our builders want to build in a lot of these places. They're constrained by real world dynamics um, that we have to get around. And it uh, doesn't mean that we shouldn't keep trying to do that. We will. Um, so, um, oh, I'll also just mention that, you know, also when you're looking at the overall regional um, allocations, you know, one thing that people, um, we talk about, you hear about a lot in 
from planners is, you know, there's the jobs housing imbalance. You know, especially Rancho Cordoba has the biggest jobs housing imbalance in the entire region. People generally move closer to their jobs. So as you build more housing units, people are generally you know, kind of helping to self-select on some of the green uh, the vehicle miles traveled because they're moving closer to where they need to get to. So it, we have a very, com we're fortunate in this region, we actually have 200 housing projects under current development of two dozen different developers building them. It's a very highly competitive marketplace. We're building a lot of places. Um, we should try to look at ways we can diversify that product line. It's, um, it, it's hard to do that though, but we're you know, working with a lot of you guys on how to do that. Um, let me see, one last couple of closing marks. I um, hope I'm not over my three minutes, but I think I am. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I just say you know that we really. I'm really encouraged by seeing some of the uh, some of the suggestions from the staff on um, just the alternatives. I mean, I think we've been long, you know, saying if you look at the data on how much uh, we were able to reduce greenhouse gases just from telework during the pandemic, it was amazing, right? And that cost us hardly anything because everyone has a telephone line already in their house. And so, looking at busing, looking at a variety, having giving builders a wide array of choices of ways that they can mitigate their projects, uh, new things that are actually having impact on the ground. Um, are things that we continue to push local jurisdictions to put into their climate action plans, to put into your um, ways that we can meet those VMT requirements under state law so that we can actually um, be effective. So that was it. Thanks so much for listening. And I'm always happy to answer questions or be available to you guys. We love to working with all of you guys in the state cog on, on these important questions. So thanks so much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that does raise a question for me. And, and I've had this conversation, I think, with James uh, probably a year ago about uh, the state law uh, about moving to a fleet of electrified vehicles. And um, I was told that we can't use that because the state has already taken um, credit for it, if, if you will. Um, so Chris brings up a good point in that there's state law that requires them to build energy efficient homes, which would reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Are we in the same boat there or can we use that at all? Uh, no. Um, the, <laughs> uh, the building, no, the built on the built, the buildings themselves, our target is strictly limited to the, um, the emissions from passenger vehicles. The, um, so we are part of the state's scoping plan that includes um, the transportation sector, um, point sources like industry, and then housing and, all, and all, of, all of the sectors that would create any kind of greenhouse gas. So the regulations that you see on the built environment is part of the scoping plan that gets California to carbon neutral. And then there's another third of the existing um, greenhouse gas emissions that is coming from the transportation sector. And then that is where, where our job lives and then a portion of that by 2035, of that roughly 33, 36%, something like that, um, a portion of that is being um, uh, reduced. The greenhouse gases are being reduced by electrification. And then there's still a gap by 2035. And that's where the MPO's jobs come in, is to get the rest of that uh, greenhouse gas emission that the state needs by 2035 on the path to carbon neutral. Um, we need to see... Uh, VMT reduction because there's still combustion uh, vehicles on the road. Carol was accounting for a portion of the state conversion. Yes, yes, yes. and our, our plan accounts for that in the Our plan in the accounts for that or CARB's plan accounts for that? Uh, CARB, CARB gets the credit for it and then we bring... So our 19% is absent that, that activity. Yep. Are there... And, and this is kind of a rhetorical question, I think, but are there any other strategies that we can work with our building community um, to implement into our plan that would help take care of that? And the, where I'm thinking is, and I, and I totally heard what you said, that uh, combustible engines are going to be out there and that's what we're trying to reduce, but... If, let's say, a builder says we're going to put electric vehicle charging stations, and I'm not suggesting this, Chris, but they're going to put one of those in every single new home they're building, just like they do solar, above and beyond what the state requires, could that be used? Yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Go yes, ahead. that could. So if we go back to... It's not coming back. 
So here, so we have EVs there. Um, and this is exactly what you're talking about. So there are potential options out there to try to incentivize EVs. Um, one, infrastructure, um, you know, charging infrastructure, so on and so forth. Also potential like buy, local buyback programs, um, stuff like that. Yeah, so the answer is yes. But as you can see on the screen, it's it, it does have an effect, but the the scale of that greenhouse gas reduction is not going to be anything, you know, compared to what is being accounted for by the state on their side of things. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's probably a, I don't know, zero to 1% um, kind of reduction. Oh. So that is one potential strategy. Yes, it is. Okay. I appreciate it. And, and I, and I just, again, want to reiterate, I'm not suggesting that home builders do that, but I just use that as an example um, because I think we heard Chris say that the cost of homes are driven by all those things, right? And, and why would we want to increase the cost of homes to do that? But I just use that as an example to see if there are other things out there that we can use, even if it's minute, because if we get to a point where we can get to 18% and that helps put us over or whatever in our plan, that, that might be something to consider. Yes, I'm in complete agreement. Um, you're hitting the nail on the head here. It's going to be a combination. Um, we're going to have to use many of the means at our disposal to hit this target. So, yes. Okay, thank you. Chair Viegas. Yeah, just a quick question. It was, we're talking about how to score additional credit. The, climate, the local climate action plans, how, are those being factored in or how, who, who, who scores those as... as um, as a, as a component of reducing the, the GHG? I don't know that, Clint, do you? Um, it's really to the extent that the climate act, the climate action plans generally are a, like a holistic, all greenhouse gas inventory and reduction. The strategies to reduce the transportation side of, out of the climate action plans, those are very relevant to the blueprint. And so when we're talking about uh, a lot of those are a lot of the strategies and caps are actually captured in some version of what is up on the screen. But if there's stuff that are in caps that are addressing transportation, um, and we just be maybe missing those things, those those are an absolutely a, a goldmine of, of information for us, especially yeah. when it gets to how do you implement this at the local level? Because you don't implement a lot of these strategies the same way in Yuba City as you do in downtown Sacramento. So the caps are a wealth of information for that. So as part of our process, we're going to have to be thoughtful and, and continue to mine uh, the, the local climate action plans in the event that there are elements embedded there that do, frankly, uh, allow us to score them as uh, su supportive of our efforts. So I just want to keep, keep, keep that in mind as we, as, we, as we go down this path. There may be other ways if we keep, the, you know, continue to be thoughtful about how we, how we mine these other plans. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's a great point. And I will say that, you know, these reduction strategies here are, it's a sampling. There are many, many more potential reduction strategies as well. These are just a few of those strategies um, that we've heard in the past. Okay, so I'm glad we're back on this slide. Um, the, I guess, when when is the, what it will cost to implement each of these strategies discussion gonna happen? Because I could imagine that each one of these and the rest of the list you could grade them on a bunch of different tables, right? The ones that are easiest to implement, the ones that are most likely to be successful, the ones that have potential for stretching, um, and then the cost per ton of greenhouse gas reduction. And you might be great on all of these things and terrible on this one, or vice versa, some other combination of things. So when when does that come in? Because I'm, it feels a little bit, based on the calendar of events, that we are making some important choices up front we are building on that with a transportation network that supports those choices and then only afterwards we're actually going to figure out what it costs when that almost demands a reevaluation of the whole thing once you have that part so the um the when we bring the discussion scenarios to you so um, I don't know if you have the calendar up, but when we bring the those, um, so the April discussion scenario, the June dra draft preferred scenario, those are financially constrained. So that we will, when you're seeing the transportation network and the programs that go along with supporting the network and the land uses, mm -hmm. we will have costs um, associated with all of those investments okay. um, and all of the programs. 
the transportation stuff specifically. Um, what we what we don't have um, comprehensively, and this is a challenge, but this is why Green Means Go exists, is what is the cost to remove all that development friction in the infill areas, right? All that infrastructure need. Mm -hmm. That's where the <laughs> really big cost is. Um, that's one that we are working on as this year on Green Means Go is hoping to do that assessment because we know $34 million is a drop in the bucket there. That that number needs to be much, much larger. larger. Um, but that is one that we just haven't got our our hands or our arms wrapped around yet is what's the total cost for all the infrastructure if we wanted to get the infill met. But on the transportation side, you'll see all the costs. I, I just, I would love for us to come out of this process with a plan that's achievable um, or at least pieces of it that we have certainty that we can achieve so that there's some success at the end of the rainbow because the, 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 the goal is tremendous, right? The costs are, I mean, pick any adjective you want, outrageous, tremendous, something outside of what we're all capable to spend, right? Um, but on, on a, you know, on a part by part basis, we should be evaluating what things we know we can do and what things we know we can afford and what things we know we can execute on so that we can, you know, come out of this with some kind of, you know, a good result. Um, I guess the only uh, the only other thing I have is just um, it would it would be helpful for me the way my brain works if we standardized on not percentages of percentages and rather on either just a single percentage of a known number and use that consistently through all presentations so of our existing greenhouse gas or the existing goal one of the two or the existing reduction. One, any of those three would work fine as long as we do it yeah. consistently. Um, and then um, it, what would be even better for me personally would be if we just talked in raw greenhouse gas units, what those reductions would be from each one of these slices of the pie. Um, because you can see the relative impact of them. And then that also feeds into the relative cost and the evaluation of the relative likelihood of success. So those all kind of tell a story together. Anyway, okay. that's all. And Thank you. Director Kozlowski, I, yeah, I, I think at least by April, we will have a standardized set of numbers that all relate and Perfect. that are all on the screen. Um, we typically use percentage, if it's a 19% reduction, you know, this gets you 2%, this gets you one, that's typically how we do it. If you'd like to see total tons, we'll certainly go back and see if we can. I don't, I don't mind what units no. you use, just as long as it's always the same units, because we went to two different ones in this, where we were starting to talk about percentages relative to each other. Understood. That's extraordinarily confusing. Understood. For me, and I yep. sit here listening to you guys all the time. So. Oh, I know. Cool. <clears throat> okay, any other questions or comments? Any Director other Lozano, if okay. I, um, I just wanted to kind of make make this point, and Zach, actually, can you go back to the strategies slide? Yes. So, um, because I think Chair Viegas was kind of hitting on this um, a second ago. You all have sort of touched on it. Um, we know that this is a steep hill to climb, right? We have a state mandate. We have to get there. We have consequences if we don't. We are also trying to do this balancing act of, um, as Zach said, the other reasons to want to do these things, right? Green Means Go is a we don't really talk about that as a climate strategy. We talk about that as an economic development strategy. We talk about that as a housing strategy, right? Revitalizing your communities. And so one of the tricks as we go through a lot of technical data and a lot of numbers uh, in the next few months, our question and why we are so glad we got AB 350, thanks to all of you and we have more time is, what does it look like to have a regional plan next year that is not SACOG's plan, is our plan, is shared among all the local jurisdictions partners what gets you, like, what are the implementation strategies in plain English that get you excited, right? What can your jurisdiction contribute to meeting the broader goals of this plan? Because every jurisdiction will have something different to contribute, right? That's, that's really important to see all of your sort of unique, uh, you know, some of you are going to be building a lot of housing and you're going to make certain contributions. Others of you are maybe going to big go big on a you know a, a school bus program in your district i mean clint said this right these are very in many ways these are localized strategies and i think what we haven't done in the past that we'd like to do more of this time around is 
have this truly be shared and owned by the region. So you each see a piece of your contribution in here that lines up with what you're trying to achieve in your communities. Does that make sense? So that's the that's a good reason why, yes, we're gonna go through a lot of the scenarios and the numbers and the approvals of the strategies. We're also gonna to try to translate those in through 2025 and really kind of make this a jointly owned plan that you know each of us is kind of committing something to through the through next calendar year. We'll call that implementation strategies, if you will. So stay tuned. Thank you. Any other questions from directors? Any other public comments? No other public comment. Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation and uh, all the work that goes into this. And I really appreciate the out outreach we've done in all of our communities with the pop-ups and stuff. Um, so looking forward to uh, the next meeting to, to discuss this further. Uh, Chair Viegas. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. First of all, I, I just real quickly, I just wanted to just remind Navy staff, I think it would be helpful for us as we go through this sort of iterative process that we provide at least a page, some sort of a summary of what we've done to date so that we, while we don't necessarily have to regurgitate everything, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a track of a tracking of, of sorts of what we've done to date as we get through, because as I said, October is going to come very quickly. There'll be a lot of questions. You know, hopefully we get to address most of them in this committee here. But the, the truth is, as we unveil the work we've done, we will know what we've done, but others will not. And so to the extent that we have something simple, that's a kind of a one pager. That's how my brain works. So I can be reminded of what we did. As many of us wear multiple hats, it would be helpful as we as we proceed. So th th thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item number four is the uh, land use implementation activities for February of 24, Doc. Good afternoon, committee members. Um, so this is an information item uh, on all of the land use implementation activities that SACOG staff participates on on an ongoing basis. We're gonna be doing this a little bit differently this year. Uh, in previous years, if you've uh, been a part of this committee, you know, We've had this as a receiving file item that comes to you every single month as well as to the full board. This year we're deciding to do it as an information item. We're gonna try to bundle everything and come to you every few months, maybe once every quarter to have more of a discussion, bring it more to the forefront so it's not buried in the staff reports. Um, I think, you know, and, and this was a great uh, intro item actually uh, that we talked about on the 2025 blueprint. We're all pretty familiar with the original blueprint process course, voluntary foundational planning and visioning process that we underwent back in 2004, 20 years ago. Think about how we as a region can grow in ways that kind of um, increases our quality of life, minimizes air pollution and congestion. As part of that process, we did adopt a set of blueprint principles. So those are housing choice and diversity, transportation options, mixed use, compact development, use existing assets, quality design, and conserving natural resources. Those principles are really integrated into everything that we do here at SACOG and, and much of the work that we've done in the last 20 years since we actually adopted that plan has been oriented around how can we as a region actually implement those principles in our regional planning processes as well as how can we support you at the local level to implement them at the local level. So uh, certainly the more formal SACOG projects and programs um, like our long range plan that we just discussed, like our funding round, those are an, an attempt to implement the blueprint as well. Uh, I'm not really gonna focus on those today. You hear about them quite a bit. This is more focused on the whole suite of activities, uh, letters, outreach, um, technical assistance that SACOG staff provides on an ongoing basis in the name of implementing the blueprint, but again, isn't necessarily built into those formal processes. Because um, we know that the, the, you know, the work doesn't just stop when we adopt the plan, right? When we award the funding for a particular project, it really just requires this intentional follow through effort. So uh, the discussion analysis section um, of your staff reports for this item is always gonna have a, a bulleted list of all the activities that we've did over the, uh, over the previous few months. So I'm just gonna go through some of the highlights um, from the staff report this time. It's gonna be in the order in your staff report if you're following along there. Um, so one thing that we uh, really love to do is to support you uh, and, and your staff's efforts to reform local land use policies to make it easier to build um, you know, infill housing, you know, attached housing, housing in low VMT areas. Um, to that end, we've been very involved in supporting 
um, a, a big planning process happening in the region right now, the city of Sacramento's general plan update, which is um, we believe positioning the city, not just as a leader in the state, but also in the country on housing policy. Um, we've, we've been involved in this for a while now. We've provided a few letters, um, but there was a, a pivotal vote that happened on that particular plan update back in November. We provided a letter. Uh, James was actually able to come out and speak in support of the uh, staff recommendation to at city council with some verbal testimony. Um, and that, that council vote effectively eliminated parking requirements across the whole city. Um, it also uh, removed all density-based restrictions. So there's no more unit-based restrictions in the city. It really opened up all of the sort of existing single family areas to um, missing middle products. So sort of quadplexes and, and courtyard apartments, that type of um, stuff that we've been really promoting uh, at SACOG. Um, so we're always really happy to come support you and your staff's bids to kind of reform local land use rules. That was just happened to be an example that we're working on, but we've um, done that for a variety of jurisdictions across the region. Um, another thing that, that SACOG uh, does to coordinate um, uh, this is to support applications for competitive grant programs. Um, so we actually facilitated an in-person workshop in this room back in um, December, I believe, uh, on the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Program, which is uh, one of the key programs in the state right now to fund affordable housing. Um, it's a uh, program that's funded through the cap and trade system, uh, administered through the Strategic Growth Council, and it's a program we've actually done very well in uh, across the region, not just in the core, but uh, you know, in places like Yuba City and up in unincorporated Placer County towards, um, towards the Tahoe Rim. So um, we had folks from, it's an advantage being in the capital for a variety of things. This is one of them. We had staff come across uh, from across the street from Strategic Growth Council to provide a presentation on you know, uh, a 101 on the program, how the program's changed, how folks can kind of set themselves up for success in this program moving forward. We had a variety of um, member agencies come out to attend that, and we've um, provided the recording of that webinar to everyone who couldn't attend. Um, so just an example of how we're really trying to support um, and, and ensure that our region continues to get our um, more than our fair share of these competitive grant programs that really help implement the blueprint. We're, of course, continuing our work on Green Means Go, uh, which was uh, talked about a lot in our last item, but we had a couple workshops in Marysville and Yuba City um, I believe in December, where we con conducted some really site-specific um, infill development analysis in those two um, cities, really looking at what it would take. You know, we were talking at a broad level on the market feasible question last item. This was a site-specific look of like, what would it actually take to see some of the, the development types that we're talking about in the blueprint on those particular sites? Um, this is actually a continuation of work that we've done uh, in Marysville, Yuba City, um, coming out of the ULI work that, uh, the Urban Land Institute work that happened earlier last year. Um, continuing the theme on Green Means Go, we're also continuing to work with the over 60 uh, grant recipients from both Green Means Go as well as um, uh, REAP One, uh, which is the Regional Early Action Planning Grant Program, some one-time funding from the state to um, support pro-housing policy change. So we have over 60 grant uh, recipients that we're working with right now. It's sort of making sure that those projects move through um, into fruition. Um, and then, you know, th the last category I'll mention here, it, and it's one of the most common things that you'll see in this item, is that we provide um, what are called MTP SCS consistency letters um, for, you know, particular housing or mixed use projects. And so uh, just to dig into that for a second here, one of the key parts of SB 375, which we talked about a lot last item, is that um, you know for projects that are consistent with our plan, you get some environmental review relief um, or you know CEQA streamlining. So um, it, we offer a service essentially where if a project or an applicant um, or a city or a county uh, wants to make use of that streamlining, they can um, go on our website and there's a full sort of easy to use worksheet where you fill that out, you send that to us, we you know, review it, make sure it looks good, send you back a letter that says we concur that that, is consist that project's consistent with our plan. Um, we are a statewide leader on this. Not every region is using this form of streamlining. We're very proud of the process that we've created and how easy we've made it. Um, there are a variety of jurisdictions that use this very frequently every month. We would love for every single one of our jurisdictions to use it. So this is, I guess, just a plug for you and your staff to, to make use of that resource. So all of that was happening a bit 
behind the scenes um, in, in December, in January. Uh, as I mentioned, this is going to be a recurring item. Um, it's going to be information every few months to track you know, all the things that SACOG staff is doing to implement the land use component of the blueprint. Some of those activities are going to be you know, an every month thing, like those letters. Some of them are going to be a little bit more of a one-off ad hoc thing. Um, part of what we really wanted to highlight here is that we are here as a resource um, for you and, your, and for your staff. You know, we do our best to stay on top of everything that's happening across the region. It's a big region, though. There's only a few folks that are, you know, working on this. So we actually really rely on, on you and your staff to, to come to us and say, hey, it, we could really use your help on this particular project. We could use your support. What can you offer? We're, we're happy to do that, and we really encourage you to do so. So um, thank you for your time, and happy to answer any questions you have. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Uh, any questions from directors? Director Lozano, and I'll uh, see if there's any questions. And I think um, good. I, I just want to try to connect the dots a little bit between what you heard from Zach and what you just heard from Dov. Um, Zach had thrown up a slide there that said, we have 278,000 housing units we want to build by 2050. And in your general plans, in infill existing footprint, we've got capacity for 760,000, right? And Director Lozano said, well, what's the use of that number? That's, you know, and you heard from Chris Norm, it's just, this is tough, right? Infill is tough. You ever started your car and you have your parking brake on and you're like, what's going on? Why is my car not moving, right? That's friction on your wheels. Um, there is friction on that 760,000 units, a ton of friction, right? And what Dov just talked about and went through are all the ways in which we're not going to get to seven, we're never going to get close to that number, but there's a lot of friction on infill. And he just ran through all the ways in which we are trying with your staff to try to remove that friction, right? Try to remove that friction. So that is... That is a we are we're very active in that way. Whether it's the city of Sacramento or CEQA streamlining or the workshops in Yuba City, Marysville, and Green Means Go, all of those are to reduce the barriers to getting this kind of infill, so we can at least get a healthy share of our future development to be infill, to be attached, to be affordable. So um, anyway, thank you, Dov. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Any other matters? I got another matter, which is, um, as I mentioned this morning in the committee, uh, we are, uh, last year, um, and Director Teeter, what we're trying to do is move the board meeting around the region so that we, uh, sometimes this is one of the uh, the few boards that you, you all sit on that has so many counties on it, right? Um, and um, last year, we went to Yuba County. We were in unincorporated Yuba County um, up in Linden Olivehurst. We went to Placer County in Roseville and Sacramento County in South Sacramento. So we're doing the other three counties this year. We're starting with Yolo County, and so the board meeting, March the 21st, will be in Woodland. Um, the folks in Woodland are very excited to host you. I know for some of you, it's a little far away. Please put it on your calendar. In fact, you should have a calendar appointment from Lynette Espinoza already. We're doing a tour, this time in advance. Last time we did it after the board meeting, kind of hard to get you to stay after. This time we're going to do an 8-ish a.m. tour, push the board meeting back to 10, and we're going to focus, actually, one thing we're going to focus on is some infill and green means go, but we're going to do a big food and ag focus. So we're going to go to Ag Start, which is a, a lab in downtown Woodland, all about sort of the uh, future of ag. And we're going to hear uh, quite a bit on sort of how Woodland's economy is centered around food and ag um, and ag tech uh, and processing. Uh, we're going to hear from the Center for Land-Based Learning. So that's an early start in Woodland, but really important um, for you to be there, and they're very excited to host you. Thursday, March the 21st, it's the March board meeting for SACOG. And then after that, we'll be in Yuba City in June, and we'll end our off-sites in El Dorado County, the chair's home county in October. Maybe we'll see Apple Hill. I don't know. We'll have to see. <laughs> Some apples and pumpkins. Excellent. Okay, any other additional items? Okay, we'll adjourn.